Hello, my name is Mike, and this is a bike. Well, it was a bike from the factory. Now, it's actually a trike. This is a 2012 Victory Cross Country with the uh, CSC conversion to it. And uh, this video is gonna be about how do we get the engine out apart on this? Because this one's got a transmission issue, and on Victory in a motorcycle, the only way you can get to the transmission gears is to completely disassemble the entire engine. So that will be our task. There's only one problem. I have absolutely no idea how any of this stuff here comes apart or goes together. Well, come along with me and we'll figure it out. In a dusty, dirty back alley in western Arizona, there is an old fart trying to cram a square peg into a round hole. He'll work on anything, just as long as it has at least two cool wheels. bike rather and we've got issues so we're gonna take it home we're gonna take it apart and uh, it is a victory so I'm somewhat familiar with everything except all this large three-wheeled assembly in the back so there's gonna be a learning curve here but we'll get our buddy Gordon on the road here as soon as we can I thought we'd have a traffic jam in a dirt alley hmm Girl Scout cookies Pallets of them. CSC, or California Sidecar, 
Uh, started business back in 1975, and you guessed it, in Southern California, building sidecars. Um, after a period of some success, a new owner bought them in 1985 and decided to expand the business somewhat. And he decided to develop some trike kits for the major brands. He also came out with a line of trailers called Escapade Trailers. As time went on, they became the largest trike uh, kit company in the world. Now, uh, since then, they've moved to Arlington, Virginia. That was back in 1998, where they still continue to build trike kits for all the major brands, including, as you guessed it, Harley Davidson, probably the biggest seller, the Hondas for the uh, for the Honda um, Goldwing series, and they built them for Indians. And of course, back in the day, they built kits for Victory motorcycles. Now, normally. When I do an engine job on a motorcycle, on a, specifically on a Victory motorcycle, I pick the bike up after I've made some removal of some components such as the exhaust and so forth. And I pick the bike up, I support the frame, front and rear, with some jack stands, and then lower the engine out from the bottom. Using this device here, this is a rolling platform that can be elevated to uh, remove the engine or raise the engine up into the frame of the bike. This lifting platform can lift up to 1,250 pounds, so I'm not too concerned about the weight of the vehicle. And as you can see, I can operate it like this. Of course, I usually stabilize the bike, and then I can elevate the bike completely off the ground. But unfortunately, on the trike, well, this device isn't going to be able to scooch underneath that trike frame and be able to pick it up. So I'm going to have to look at an alternative method of getting the bike raised enough to be able to remove the engine from it. I also have a hoist, as you can see, in order to lift up cars, four wheel devices. But, well, I'm not going to do too well on this. It looks like it's probably a little too narrow. And even if I can pick it up from the back end somewhere, well, it's going to be way too narrow at the front. So I've got to figure out some way to be able to get this thing up in the air so that I can drop the engine out from underneath it. And today's not a really good day to be working out here. Even though I've got covering here, it's damn cold and windy. Two days ago, I was riding my motorcycle with a t-shirt on. Today, well, we've had a little bit of snowfall. So, you know, they say it never snows in Arizona. Well, they lie. Uh, some of you may have noticed the, uh, the clothing I'm wearing here, and it says right here, 11 calories per centimeter square. That's a burn rate. These are actually flash resistant clothes. And that's because, well, I'm kind of clumsy and I inadvertently catch things on fire. So at least I'm protected. Maybe not the trike, but I will be. Now, as close as I can figure, to remove the body, there are several bolts that can be accessed from the trunk. The trunk up here. I've got some bolts down here underneath the carpet, and a couple of more bolts way back up in the back corner there. So there's four that I found so far. Okay, but first, I have to get the seat out of the way. To get the seat out of the way, I have to remove the side panels to get to the bolts. These side panels are just held down by little pop-in clips. So a nice pull here, there's three of them, and side panels come off. And then you have a bolt right in here that holds the seat on. The backrest on most of these just pulls out, so those are pretty easy to remove. And then the seat can be pulled up and out of place. The bike has a heated seat, so there's a wire harness that needs to be unplugged. There's one end, and there's the other end there. And then the seat can be removed, and you can see it will then give clearance for the body to come up. There's a harness here that goes to the lights inside the tour pack, so I assume there's a connector underneath the body once it gets lifted up far enough to reach it.
it is cold outside. I'm so glad that Bob was able to help me get this uh, machine in out of the cold. Fortunately, in my garage, I have the ability to stay somewhat warm while I'm working on my projects because I happen to have a 246,000 BTU leg burner. Works great. And this will keep the garage warm enough that I can actually get a little bit of work done and hopefully get this engine taken out. Looking at the trike add-on, uh, I'm really impressed. It's really well engineered. It's a beautiful piece of workmanship and engineering. Uh, basically, the original drive belt from the Victory uh, drives an idler shaft, which in turn drives another belt, which turns the rear differential back here. You can see the belt in the cog right there. Start with, I'm going to go ahead and remove the fuel tank and the exhaust system. Those have to come off anyway. And with the exhaust system out of the way, I'll get a better look at the rear section. There's four bolts that go through the, uh, the rear portion of the frame, and they look like they're the same on this setup as they are on a regular uh, Victory Cross Country. So uh, I'll be pulling some various things off as well, probably take his lowers off and get them out of the way. Uh, I've got to get to one mount at the front that holds the front head. So that's my course of action. Alright, I pulled all the front uh, front fairing components loose and now we can gain access to some of the other components we need to get to such as the front engine mount and the exhaust uh, pipe coming out of that head. So that's got to be removed. We can also now access the lower frame members and the brake lines and some of the other stuff that's got to be disconnected before we can get the engine out.
Now something is really giving me a hard time here. I'm trying to separate the front pipe from the rear pipe. Right down here is a clamp. And the clamp had been tightened down so tight that it actually indented the rear tube onto the front tube. So I ended up there, I had to cut a little clamp here. I can replace that easily enough. And get in here with a, uh, the hammer and a screwdriver to try and separate the pipes. I actually had to kind of flare them out so I get them separated. Something you may encounter um, when I go back together with it, of course, uh, I'll make sure that it seals properly. But uh, boy, that was a struggle. And I've taken these exhausts apart before and they've never given me a hard time as this particular one did. Something you have to watch out for though. Uh, anyway, back to it. I've removed the lower frame components and I'm now disconnecting the battery tray. It has a lot of electrical connections here as you can see. Um, we've already disconnected the starter. The solenoid stays with the bracket. We've got a very large ground here where a whole bunch of, of the, uh, the engine systems grounds, grounds to the engine block itself. We'll have to disconnect the stator wire here from the system and then we'll have to disconnect these oil cooler lines here going into the engine. And that'll take care of this section. Then we'll have to come up here and focus on all this stuff up here. The ignition system, the throttle bodies, the throttle cables and all that. So to get access to most of that stuff, the tank's gonna have to come off. So that'll be our next task, get the tank out of the way. just right, I might be able to make a torx driver work on an Allen. I don't recommend it because it's a good way to strip out both, but being that I lost the correct Allen, you know, I'm going to cheat. Bad. Bad Mike. It's working. I guess if it works, it's really not that bad in a day after all. I wouldn't put a lot of torque on it, a lot of force, but these aren't real, real tight, so I can get away with it. Now, I've got fuel lines to disconnect under the tank, as well as electrical connectors. And the fuel pump is in the tank on this piece. And there's a single high pressure line that comes out of it. And the line has got a weird little kind of squeeze clip type deal. And you need a lot of strength to get it loose. I usually struggle with it a lot. Uh, sometimes I get in there with some pliers and I can get enough force to get it to come loose. We'll see how that pans out this time. It might cooperate this time. You never know. Oh, come on up, bitch. Fuel line. There it goes. Is and squeeze, squeeze the sides. 
with your fingertips. Rotate slightly. Oh, it hurts. Nope. Ow! I'm cooperate. Figures. Ah, fake ugly gas tank. Come to Papa. There we go. Oh, and of course, you've got plenty of fuel in her, as always. Ah, they always come to me. Hold the brim. C3 and C4 on my back. Don't like that. Isn't it falling? Of course you are. You need a stable place for this bad guy. Good! Eh, that's reasonably stable. On top of a bunch of tools. So this is that fuel line connector I, I struggled with. Let me show you how it works. So, if you look at it there, you see the blue area? That's what locks it into place. So you're reaching up underneath the tank with the weight of the tank, crushing your uh, forearm. At the same time, you have to exert enough pressure to push these little blue things in. But the problem is you have to push them in past the black surface. They've actually got to go in further then your fingers will allow them to go. It's just not good. And of course, you usually end up hurting your fingertips by pushing so hard. Um, they could have done a little bit better design than that. And then you have one connector here for the fuel tank. We'll be removing the coil pack and uh, any ad additional cables on this side as well as on the other side. And here now you can see the throttle cable. We'll be able to disconnect it just fine. There's the other end of that fuel line. Uh, what I've done in the past when I really had a hard time getting that one, I was actually able to disconnect it right here instead. So again, you got a green push button deal, but it was easier to get on this end and disconnect this side than it was the other end. So there's an alternative for you. By removing the coil and ignition switch bracket, you'll be able to get to some of the other wire harnesses that need to be unplugged. So you've got uh, fuel injectors and, you know, you got your sparkling plugs and all kinds of other wires over here. But once this is out of the way, you can now see some of the other connections. There's a lot of stuff in there. How come the light isn't on? Yesterday the light was on when I didn't need it. Well, that's, you know, so typical. And the light still isn't on. What the hell? I don't understand it. it. Doesn't even give me the option. Guys, you're gonna have to take my word for it. In that dark void, there are several connectors. Let me see if I can find another light. Flashlight. All right. Anyway, you've got a TP sensor to disconnect. Uh, you've got the ignition switch and the coil. Right there, those two. And uh, there's also an engine temperature, engine oil temperature, and a couple of fuel injectors. I think what's going to happen, though, is they're kind of hard to get to. So once we remove the front mount, which is right up here, and the rear mount, which is right back there, and then there's four bolts at the back holding it to the frame, the engine will drop out and come down. We'll be able to get to the other connectors, once the engine has been lowered down away from the frame, give us a little more room to work. We'll see how that goes. Okay, so now my phone has decided to cooperate and the light is actually working. I don't understand it. That's why I call them smartphones. They're smarter than the people operating them in many cases. Now, the four bolts I'm talking about at the back of the engine, let me crawl down here. You can see two there, and then there's two more up there, two on each side. And they appear to be a 16 millimeter. But since they don't have a 16 millimeter, I will attempt to round the heads off with a 5 8 because, well, that's pretty close to 16. Not real sure why I don't have a 16 millimeter. Not even sure why they use 16 millimeter heads on these bolts. That's a little unusual. Usually they're either a 15 or a 17. Kind of weird. Let's just see if we can get these buggers loose. I've got this hand to deal with that you won't find on a normal motorcycle. They've got a skid plate here, which is protective, but very, very much in my way. Might have to pick it up. We'll see how that goes.
And now we can get access to all the different connectors and so forth in here that we need to unplug. We'll pull this engine out, we'll get it set on the bench, and we'll split the cases. Well, there it is, guys. Took a little doing to get her out, but we got her all out. We're going to take her apart and figure out what went wrong. Uh, we're going to end this video here because, well, I don't like my videos to run real long. And if you want to find out what's inside, well, you just have to come back for the next video. So this concludes part one. Part two, we'll turn to it and find out why this particular vehicle locked up on my buddy Gordon going down the highway. Could be a pretty, uh, pretty scary situation when you're when your uh, transmission locks up and there's that's neutral shouldn't do that so we're going to turn into this thing we're going to rip it apart we're going to split the case and we're going to look inside and see you know uh, what uh, came apart in the trans causing it to lock up hopefully not enough metal got through the system to do any damage to the to the cylinders or anything like that my experience has been because I have worked on these with bad transmissions before my experience has been that if you shut them down soon enough you usually don't do much or any damage uh, to the rockers or the cams or, or the cylinders. So we got that far. We'll see you in the next video.